This is the much anticipated Any Slobby reading vlog slash reaction video, uh, basically where I, Jimmy Nuts, one half of Dudes Talking Manga here for the channel, read through about when I finish a volume or I get to a really amazing chapter and I can't hold it anymore. I come upstairs, I get in front of the camera, and I just blurt out my feelings, uh, thoughts, and even some really terrible theories that generally are never <laughs> actually true. Uh, I did this for Water 7 arc in my last video in the Reception was overwhelmingly positive, so thank you all so much for that. With all that said, Any Slobby <laughs> has already become my favorite arc, and I'm only into volume 40. So to be completely clear, this is covering chapters 375 to 388. At this point in this video, I have not read past that. I will later. Water 7 was a gut punch. Water 7 had a lot of stuff that uh, hurt, and the crew seemed like it was on the edge of collapse, and I wasn't, I wasn't thrilled. I was feeling it. Uh, definitely in Water 7, but man, Any's Lobby has already started out with feeling like the comeback is prepped and ready to go. There are defenses being, uh, sh you know, thrown out there by Any's Lobby and the government, but they cannot stand up to our heroes, whether it be from their abilities, their powers, or their abilities to uh, communicate with other people, as we see with Usopp and the Giants, which I will touch on a little bit later. But without a doubt, my favorite thing so far in Any's Lobby, just in these first volume and a half, and my favorite thing maybe in One Piece ever is Second Gear Luffy. I am a massive fan of Dragon Ball and Dragon Ball Z, and the power-ups are my favorite. And Second Gear Luffy is not the only thing I, I could point to that makes me feel right at home as a DBZ fan, but also the CP9 uh, power chart that is displayed in the manga, where they literally give numbers and rankings. I just... I don't know why I love it. Maybe it's a little bit corny for other people, but it's something that I just adore. I went and watched this in the anime as well. I read in the manga first and I said, well, I gotta watch the anime episode. And I'm so glad I did because it was freaking awesome. Luffy uh, is clearly very special. Uh, the devil fruit powers is what I've always been pointing towards. And then just his stubbornness and, and who he is and never giving up and defending his friends. It's very clear that there's something going on with his family, but now, like, my eyebrows are fully raised, and I'm like, what is Luffy exactly? Because it, it almost seems like there's something totally different. Like, there's a whole nother layer to Luffy that I didn't really consider, because second gear, I, first off, I didn't know there was a first gear. And now there's a second gear, and now I'm wondering what gear really is, and I, where did these abilities come from, and why are they happening to Luffy, and how is he able to train it? Like, he had to have knowledge about it than to level it up, I think. And it seems that, you know, he was able to use the shave technique from Bueno, and it's like he's taking away abilities from people that he's fighting. So he's like taking away from something from that. He's very perceptive and he's able to learn uh, godly quick. I mean, it, it's crazy. And he says, I'm so glad I ran into you guys when I did, because after uh, running into Aokiji, I knew that I was gonna be facing tougher people. So he's definitely aware that like he's able to do something like this. And I just need to know why. Why did this happen? But it was so exhilarating to read and to watch. As far as any crackpot theories, my first thing kind of goes to the fact that I feel like there's a chance that Luffy and his lineage is tied to something very uh, devious possibly. And that it's not just devil fruit powers that you have to worry about with Luffy, but this whole gear thing and him being able to power up and level up and there's steam coming out of his body. What is that? Does the government have anything to do with it? Cause clearly, uh, they are very, very powerful. I said in the water seven arc that I had my big theory at the beginning of that video was that, uh, Nico Robin was a part of a government secret program for children. And that, you know, that is basically what led her to end up being this monster. I was completely wrong, of course. So now I'm going to reuse that theory. And I think that maybe Luffy is a part of some lineage from a government program, maybe at one point or something. Uh, I don't know, but this was the biggest, oh crap moment, like jaw dropper, uh, fist pump it, whatever you want to say it. And Luffy has so many good quotes in this section. Do whatever you want with the world government. We can't, just came to get Robin back. And I thought that that was excellent. I said, well, that might be the panel of this section that I remember the most, but then we get the very last section, the very last page of the manga. And it says, uh, with a, uh, when the fight is over, the world will ring with the sound of that straw hat boy's name. And then it, it's Luffy yelling at like the base of the door, Robin, I've come for you. And then Frankie, who I love, says, he came. Robin, sweat beating down her face, says, Luffy? And then you see that Stan Dam's like, what? And then Luffy just yelling. And it's just like, I love it. I love it so much. Uh, these are among the best panels 
in the series so far for me, but also some of the best scenes. And second gear Luffy takes the cake uh, for leveling One Piece up as a whole, not just Luffy. I'm I'm so in, guys. I'm so in. And Luffy's not the only one powering up. I love the fact that the climate baton has been perfected and Nami ends up throwing out a strike that reminds you a lot of uh, Ener or Anel back in Skypea, like just roast people. Unfortunately, it wasn't able to solo out the enemies, which is something that maybe Sniper King or Usopp needs to work on. Uh, and then there's also Sniper King. Like I just said, what in the world is all of this? Uh, we got introduced to that back in Water 7, but I really love the fact that Chopper and Luffy are like, whoa, Sniper King's a hero. And then you have like Nami and Zora in the back, like, oh my God, it's obviously Usopp. Sniper King ends up having a wonderful interaction with some giants that whenever I was first introduced to at the ga gates, I was like, oh no, I'm going to have to cheer against giants. I don't want to, because if you watch my old videos, you know, Little Garden, I love that arc and I absolutely love giants in any medium but it turns out that they were a part of the crew uh that were under the two giants back in little garden this is such a dope callback to little garden and dory and Bragi and Usopp being able to i'm sorry sniper king being able to turn them and really turn the tides of the battle because of them was such a major moment and shows that sniper king or Usopp, whatever we want to call him uh always seems to come through in the most like random and clever way possible. And this time it was just because he had so much love for that culture back whenever he met the giants on little garden. And then seeing that pay off how many chapters later, uh, this is the stuff that is going to make one piece become a favorite story of mine. Like I said, Nami with the climate baton, I really enjoyed the quote. I thought the girl was a backup, but she's a full fledged warrior. You're damn right. She is. And Zoro and Sanji are, uh, you know, at each other's throats still, but they're beating cheeks like no one's business out there. And we have to talk about something that I feel like I've never put enough light on as a reader until now. And that is devil fruits. Uh, whenever I first saw it, I said, Oh, like these are cool abilities. I just kind of accepted as fact in the world and was excited to see what other kind of devil fruits were out there. I did at one point have the question of whether or not devil fruits could possibly have like a revive ability and hey maybe i don't i don't know and i don't know yet but devil fruits come up here because stan dam has two of them and he has no idea what the power's on which is super duper shady and i'm also questioning where he got these from but he says he has a connection is that alkaji maybe is he out there roaming the seas finding these things and bringing them back to stan dam i'm not sure i'm sure we'll get an answer for that later but these devil fruits are going to be given to Khalifa and is it Kaku? I can't remember the dude's name. I'll probably put it over the video later in editing. I just can't remember it right now. It's the guy with the uh, Pinocchio type nose that uh, jumped off tall things. Anyways, they're going to take these devil fruits just blindly, which is kind of crazy. But they're also talking about how their martial art ability is going to be able to mesh with this. And there's concern that maybe the devil fruit would actually harbor a demon inside them and maybe kill them. And then we hear something about someone getting too greedy, taking two devil fruits and it essentially destroying them. You can't take two devil fruits. In these type of stories, whether it be anime or anything else, whenever there's these amazing feats being happening, especially when we just seen Luffy go into second gear here. Just crazy, by the way. I just I love that. Anyways, back to the point. When you can see these big feats happening, when someone says something can't be done, that means that it might be done later. And it would make for a really big moment because in world, it is unlikely and it would be uncanny for someone to do this. It would be a legendary act. So I'm immediately saying, okay, they said you can't take two devil fruits. Why not? Can we figure out a way to do that? Is that something that Luffy will do later down the road, possibly as our main character? Or maybe that is something that'll be reserved for another character like Zoro or whatever else. I don't know, but I had my brain a working. I also then took it a little step further and being like, you know, I don't know where devil fruit actually comes from unless if I'm forgetting, which is definitely possible. I forgot about Fishman back in Arlong. So anything's really possible for, for me to forget with this many chapters being my first read. But like not knowing really the true origin of devil fruit, how it's harvested, passed around or whatever, I start to wonder, is it possible to reverse the effects of a devil fruit? Like, can you get out of it possibly? And can you take someone else's devil fruit powers from them somehow? And I only thought about this because it seems like Luffy is able to adapt people's abilities. Like he is learning, studying, and then able to do it in like record time. Like no one else could do this. This is absurd. And CP9 are the most capable people we've probably ran into at this point. And uh, Blano is completely blown away by Luffy's ability to learn. So it's like, okay, well, if he can take their martial arts, there's a chance he can maybe learn a devil fruit power that isn't his own. Like, is there a way to maybe 
extract that power from the devil fruit or something like that. So these are just things floating around my head. And if you've read the series before, you're probably thinking I'm an idiot at this point. And maybe in editing, I'll put up a little thing that says, I'm a moron or you're a moron here. Um, that would be likely. I think it happened a bunch in Water 7. But these are just some of the thoughts that are rattling around my brain. And I'm just realizing I haven't paid enough attention to devil fruit. And I don't think I truly have thought too much about like the extent of which it is in the world. So this was my wake up call and I'm paying attention now. And after the beat down emotionally that Water 7 was, just having any lobby open up with some of these just amazing little lines that really took me uh, hook, line, and sinker, and just fell in love with this arc already. And that's like Frankie being able to get through to Robin a little bit. And we, by the way, we're seeing Robin starting to build confidence, start building doubt. I think she is coming around to the fact that she does want to be rescued and that, that she does want to continue to be with the Straw Hats, I hope, as she was my favorite crew member until Water 7. Um, but Frankie tells her existing isn't a crime. And this is off the back of the lesson that Tom had taught him about a ship being neither good or evil, no matter what they do. Uh, it, it doesn't really matter because it's actually more about what people use it for. And it's their fault, not necessarily the ships. So Nico Robin is now learning that lesson as well. Holly looking at Zorro and saying, hey, when you see the CP9, when you see Lucci in them, let them know they're fired. What a line. Oda continues to be able to put wildlife in these stories that are so impactful and have so much character. And also Chopper being kind of like a translator for them helps so very much and gives Chopper something to do, which I love. I I felt a little uh, twinge in my heart, uh, to be honest with you, whatever Gamora ends up running through that wall. And like we think down for the count has been blinded, can't see, and then runs through the wall and then just all hell breaks loose. Let's go. That's the stuff I love. Uh, also, how giant of an animal is Gamora? Like, I didn't realize until you see like laying out in the middle of everyone. You're like, this is massive. No wonder they were able to carry uh, all the Straw Hat crew in uh, Frankie's family. I mean, this is this is excellent. I love them as side characters, and I think Oda does wildlife better than anybody else. So I'm happy at the start of Annie's Lobby because I feel like we're finally going to get some of that comeback, that comeuppance that we need to give CP9. Uh, I am, however, very worried about what's going to happen because generally when things start trending in the right way, Oda will knock us down a bit. That's also just how storytelling kind of goes in Shonen. So I'm cautiously optimistic that I might be happy that the next update that I come to you, and I hope I'm not as stressed out as I was in Water 7. <laughs> I'm ready to go. Second Gear, Jimmy is here, and this is going to be a super fun vlog. Welcome back. I did not expect to be back so soon. I've only read five chapters since the last time that I sat down and talked to you all, but I I couldn't. I had to put it down middle of volume 41. So I'm going to be talking about chapters 389 through 393, which is about halfway through a marvelous Nico Robin flashback that I could not be happier with so far. It is very sad, but if you've been watching my videos, you know my favorite thing about One Piece has been the Poneglyph, the world history being void, and just Nico Robin in general. And I, I couldn't, I couldn't do anymore because even though it's not a lot of chapters, there's a lot to talk about, at least for me, and me going off on some kind of crackpot thought trails that are probably ridiculously wrong. But either way, I felt like it was time to come up here and film. It just felt right. We're at a part now where basically Nico Robin's back to her, like, very annoying ways and she's saying i just want to die and you know nico robin you start you starting to piss me off a little bit with this like just shut up and join back with the crew they're risking their lives like the the effort that has been given to bring her back is absurd maybe to the point where it might not even be worth it possibly i don't know uh, i'm sure it will be in the end but like if you're looking at the effort of this and what it means for the straw hats post uh, Any's lobby is going to be crazy. They are going to be the most wanted people in the world, maybe of all time. Like, I don't know if this is going to put them above the level of someone like Roger, but it has to be close. Luffy has the right of it. He says, if you're planning on dying, that's fine, but let us rescue you first. You can die later. Like, do that later and just leave the rest to us, which is the panel with the crew. I finally have joined Luffy on the rooftops. I mean, this is some of the best stuff. Uh, we've seen it one piece. I'm ecstatic. Like, I love this so much. The, the panel of them all standing on the rooftop, one of the best panels so far in the series, but all of this is fine and dandy. Typical stuff that we're going to be expecting from the crew in this situation. Nico Robin being very difficult. Uh, also Frankie's, you know, got them busted out, but he did it with the, this, the fart ability, um, the coop event or something like that. I don't know how much I love that, but none of that really matters because 
We're talking about the Nico Robin flashback that has all of the goodness that I wanted. I am so happy we are getting Nico Robin at eight years old and she has her devil fruit powers, which is why all the kids think she's so weird, I think, and why they're calling her a monster. And Aunt Roji absolutely sucks. I'm gonna take my own kids out. Uh, sorry, Nico Robin, eat just enough toast and just a little bit of jam and clean the whole house before we get, like, what are you doing? Who, who treats children like this? This is absolutely ridiculous. I hate Aunt Roji. I hope when the buster call comes, she's the first one to die. All right, that might be too extreme, but you know, she's eight. The one place that little Robin seems to be accepted is the fact that she can go into the tree of knowledge, uh, basically the library tree, and she has all the other archeologists and the scholars that are there, and it seems like she is part of them. And anytime a tree is transformed into somewhere where you can enter, whether there's a trap door or it gets turned into a house or a library, whatever it might be, that's something since I was little, I've always been infatuated with. I remember like attempting to carve out doors and trees because I thought that they led down into tunnels. I don't know. I was a strange kid, but it's just something I love seeing in fiction and fantasy. So I was really pumped up about that. And then you get in there and there are some little interesting details, especially one that I want to point out. Professor Clover is going on and on about how Robin has passed her test and she's a genius and she's now an archaeologist and gives her what I think is like a pendant or something. But while he's talking, of course, my conspiracy brain goes to the fact that there is a model of what seems to be a, we'll call it a planetary system, not a solar system, because at the at the center of it, it's like in the middle of the library, it seems, and have all these planets. And I think the planet that we are on in one piece is at the center. So it, it's a planet centric system instead of being around a star. And this is interesting to me because I want to know, do they have the right of it? You know, we at one point thought the earth was the center of everything and then it turned out we were wrong. So I'm wondering if they are correct. And if they are correct, how does that work? How, <laughs> how do solar systems and planetary systems work in this universe? And yeah, I know I'm going down a weird rabbit hole here, but just, just follow me a little bit. The other part of my brain wants to say, are we going to go to any of these other planets? Because they had like very unique features. Some were smooth. Some had lumps. Like, are they made of gas? Are they solids? Uh, do aliens from these planets ever come here? Uh, I joked way back in one of my earlier videos. I can't remember which one it was, but I'm sure somebody will remember it. Uh, that, hey, are we going to get aliens in one piece? And I was like half kidding. But now I'm like, are we going to get aliens in one piece? And I'm kind of serious now. So that's my big tinfoil hat thing at this point, uh, and I wanted to share that, and it's like a lot of what this update is about, but I don't know. I just like going off on these things, and I'm trying to pay attention to every single detail and every single panel to pull things away that I can make predictions on, because like that's half the fun of this and embarrassing myself with these predictions. Uh, the bigger takeaway, though, is that just whenever it seems like Robin does have a place to belong and does have people that care about her and make her feel included, she mentions the Pontic Lift and the void in history, and they don't like that. The scholars are not about that life. They do not want a child, even though she is a genius, to have this secret and to know this, because if this gets out, they're going to get destroyed by the government, which is about to happen. Seeing Robin run out and, again, being an outcast, it's just like she really doesn't have a place to fit in. And it shows why the Straw Hat crew has been such an important thing for her and make her feel so conflicted. Uh, it is it is a rough going for an eight year old. Clearly here, uh, we hear that she's following the same footsteps as her mother. All Al Alvia is how I'm going to pronounce it. I was thinking Olivia, but there's no other I there, so it has to be Al Alvia. And it seems like she has left in search of this history, and she has an interest in it, just like Nico Robin. And right whenever Nico Robin is being kind of abandoned by her mom, which is very sad, uh, it's. It's shouted out that, you know, if you want to fulfill your husband's wishes, you'll come on this boat and go on this journey and leave Robin here. And now I'm curious of what all of the wishes were for Robin's father. Who was Robin's father? And when am I going to get information about that? I hope it's it's following soon. You know, I, I cut off, I assume, in the middle of this flashback or somewhere in, in the middle of it. And that's a question that I now have. But Alvia seems to be very similar to Robin. She comes back and all of the crew that she was with is dead. And she's saying, hey, they're coming here to a hair and they're going to destroy you all. And it's my fault. And she has so much guilt for leaving Robin that it does make me have sympathy for her. And I, I would hope to see maybe a little bit more of her adventures. And I, I need to know what she saw when she was at sea. And if a Nico Robin flashback wasn't enough, 
Oda wrote this exclusively for me, as you heard in my last update. I love the Giants. And there's another giant named Jaguar D. Saul, who is actually relating with Nico Robin, which is really nice, and being nice to her and hanging out. And he's building his raft. His name is Jaguar D. Saul. All of his relatives have the D in middle initial. Uh, does that sound familiar? Sure it does. We're talking about Roger D. We're talking about Monkey D. Luffy. Is, is this a relative of Luffy's? How would Luffy be related to giants? I don't know. And this is mind-blowing stuff. That, like, this is what I love about One Piece. I am so down for this. And then I start looking and I say, well, Monkey D. Luffy. Okay. And then this is Jaguar D. Luffy. So are animals somehow, like, like how did that name get picked? I have no idea. What is going on? <laughs> I'm just... So down, I'm loving this and I'm freaking out. I'm talking about planetary systems. I'm seeing possible giant relatives to Luffy. I, oh my goodness, this is too much. Also, what about Ace? Like, uh, this is great. And as we're making our way through this flashback, we also are seeing people that were in previous roles and different types of people so many years ago, 20 years ago. So we do end up seeing uh, Aokiji and he is called Ad Vice Admiral Kuzan or Kuzan. I'm not sure how you pronounce that, but he seems very different in this flashback. I mean, still seems like he goes on walks and, and maybe doesn't want to be disturbed, but he's sleeping, but he just seems different. And I'm curious to see how he ended up climbing the ladder. I'm assuming he has something to do with the buster call uh, that we're going to end up seeing because that's how O'Hare ends up being destroyed in all of Robin's homeland, which is crazy. Also, it's interesting to think that like she wasn't accepted in her homeland. So how much does she really mourn for that? And her people are still around. Like, are there any other survivors from O'Hare, possibly? And where is Saul in all of this? I, I'm not sure. I mean, we're getting more talks about the giant and Elbaf and the way of the warrior and that there's gentle giants. And I just, I felt slightly overwhelmed, which is common in One Piece, but more so than ever before. So I want to come up here and record this before this section would end up being like 35 minutes long. I think it's better to break it up so I can really take time to get into every little detail I want since it's kind of like you're experiencing it with me and I'm going back to reading. So I'll see you again real, real soon. Maybe it'll be one chapter. Maybe it'll be five chapters. Maybe it'll be a whole volume. I'm not sure. Um, we'll see. I want to live. The best three words uttered in one piece. Let's go. Right after Luffy looks, as soon as Robin says it, Luffy's like, let's go go. I'm covering 394 to 399. I finished up uh, volume 41 and uh, does it get better than this? There's no way it gets better than this. This has to be like the peak of this vlog, but also the peak of this arc, right? In this saga. This is insane. Uh, Nico Robin wants to live after saying she wants to die so many times. And it is just this moment of culmination of history and of being repressed and, and an outcast and accepting the fact that people do want to be her friend and love her. And uh, wow, I mean, just absolutely mind blowing. The three words uh, could have so much power and backstory to it. And as soon as Robin says, I want to live, Luffy's like, let's go. Like we're here, we're gonna do it now. And all hell starts breaking loose. And then we dive down into the waterfalls. This this Nico Robin backstory has been a long time getting the details. I think Oda does an exceptional job uh, with backstories. Everyone knows how I feel about Chopper's backstory. Drum Island's one of my favorites, uh, but they're all really, really good. This is like a different level. It feels like this backstory does so much more than any of the others to build up the world and the lore and what's more to come. And now has entered into this conflict of one of the most ballsy moves that Luffy could have done, and he shoots down the world government flag. And I'm sitting there like, okay, we have just declared war on the world government. And I believe that Luffy can beat them. That's the best part about this, is that it doesn't feel like, you know, this is silly for silly sake, or he's biting off more he can chew. It's like, I am fully on board with second gear Luffy, and now with Nico Robin wanting to live. Uh, Luffy is an incredible character just incredible as is nico robin i needed to get that out first because like that is the the bulk of this reaction in these few what six seven chapters or whatever i read in the rest of volume 41 was just to say that like we've been building towards this for so long and all of the hardship of water seven coming to this moment and it like the payoff is actually there like oda is the king of payoff i 
I'm a big fan. I'm a big fan. And we cannot uh, talk about how good of a moment this is without talking about seeing Nico Robbins' childhood uh, trauma, essentially, and seeing her island burnt down, O'Hara, uh, or O'Hara, depending on how you say it. And I just, the, the library being burnt and the scholars basically being sentenced to execution and all that is so rough. And it makes the world government seem uh, pretty terrible, right? But I still get this feeling that maybe there is another side to the world government, or at least people within it that aren't all bad. And I think al even though he says, if, if you mess up, I'll kill you, the fact that he is the reason why Robin was able to get away, I was already interested in al and the admirals in general, but th now I'm really into it. And we end up seeing the other admiral, which I don't have my notes on me right now because I just wanted to come get this out. Um, but we see that he is uh, real bad. He ends up blowing up the ship of refugees that basically are saying, hey, you guys don't know anything about the Poneglyphs. We're going to let you go. And he blows it up. And that is a stark contrast. Like that is so much more in line with like Spandam and the rest of the people in the world government. And then you have Alkaji. So I like the fact that, you know, this is a terrible, terrible moment and terrible actions from this organization or this government. But he still takes time to have Alkoji have this moment of like nuance. And that's what allows Robin to get away. And it feels like he's actually giving her a chance. And I think maybe that chance came back to play in Robin's mind and, and it did contribute to the fact that she wanted to live, uh, among all of the other things. Uh, this is also a really interesting uh, parallel to the Giants, because we saw good old Saul. And I told you I love Giants. And I was so sad when I figured out that he was in the world government, that he was in the Marines. I was like, no, or the Navy. It was the Navy or Marines, doesn't matter. I was like, no, 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 no. I want to like this guy. I don't want this to be a flip on me. But we again see somebody that's within the government, working for the government, turning against it and actually standing up for what is right and what they think is just. Like justice is the big theme here. And like, what is justice and and who can deliver and who says what is right and what is wrong? Uh, that is something that's probably going to be explored even more so as we are now at war with the world government. But Saul, ah, oh, man standing up for Alvia and basically getting her out and then showing up here on a Hara. Um, I love him. Whenever he, whenever he gets shot in the head, I thought he was dead. And I know I've said one piece, no one dies, but like I, in the moment I'm reading, I'm like, Oh my God, no, 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 not Saul, not Saul. And so he ends up uh, picking up the ship. I literally was like, uh, I showed my wife. I was like, you have to look at this. This is insane. And then like, I, uh, I turned on the anime and I actually watched the scene with her and she's like, that's pretty crazy. Like, it's pretty wild. I'm like, yeah, this is awesome. Uh, so obviously I love Saul, but he's another person that's showing that the, even though the world government is truly up to some despicable things and the elders might maybe all evil, maybe possibly, I don't know, because we don't know them on an individual level yet. Uh, there are at least people within the government that think they're doing the right thing. And when they see the wrong thing happening, um, they're trying to correct those mistakes as best they can. I mean, Saul really took a stand and became a, uh, you know, he went AWOL, essentially, and uh, and went rogue, which, thank God, because I didn't want to cheer against any giants. I was extremely emotional watching Robin and her mother, like, reunite, and then that big struggle, and uh, it was tough. And I think Oda does a really nice job of earning those moments, but he does a great job of writing them and drawing them and just the way that they are framed and the facial expressions that he chooses to show us. Uh, this is this is really great. Like I've obviously really loved One Piece to this point, and I've had multiple people tell me that One Piece is their favorite story of all time. And I was like, well, it's probably like not quite there for me yet. But with this, if this continues at this level, yeah, it, it probably will be because those moments could have very easily felt like, oh, okay, move on. But like, I found myself revisiting those panels and thinking about. Robin and the impact this would have on her character, like her or as a person, but also for her mother, who's been out there looking for the Poneglyphs. What has she seen? And we also noticed that uh, basically it was being said, hey, we, we can just kill her. Uh, we don't need her anymore. But right before that, they said, hey, bring her because she knows something and we need her. And then when things get hairy, um, you know, they're, they're going to jet out of there. So I'm just wondering uh, what it was that she held in her mind or info that they needed. And another quick thing about this that is kind of mysterious to me is the fact that they burned the world tree, right? And then they threw the book, the burning books, I think into like this lake bed and the books perfectly fit the lake bed. What's up with that? It's just like one or two panels where they mentioned like, well, look at that. All the books fell up the lake bed. Is that a coincidence? And I'm like, 
am I missing something? Like, it might be something super obvious, or maybe I'll get my answer in like a couple chapters because that's what kind of what happens in this format of uh, reacting and reviewing to this these things. But uh, I definitely caught my eye, and I'm very curious if that has any more consequence later down the line. And the Pontyglyph stuff has been my favorite thing in One Piece world building and wanting to know what it's all about. And Professor Clover knew a lot more than I thought they did. They had gotten really far in their research and he basically says, hey, I'll tell you all about it right now. I'll tell you a little bit about what we know. And he's talking about how obviously the Pontyglyphs have inscribed the history of the 100 year void, but it shows that someone was so desperate to get the history down. They knew if they put it on paper or record, whatever, like normal record, that it would end up being erased that the people who came in power right after that 100-year void, which was the world government, uh, would not want this out. And that's what the Pontyglyphs are holding. They're holding that history. And there is proof that there was an immense kingdom during this time. And they must have been a great, powerful nation. Uh, and now they cease to exist, and they knew that their message would be erased. So, I mean, it seems to point to the fact that the world government was at odds with these people, and their very presence in the historical record is terrifying to them, but but why? They're not even willing to fund the research themselves and then kind of keep it underneath their hood. They're just like, no, we don't want any of this out there. And now I want to know even more about this. And this is my crackpot theory at this point in One Piece's story. I have a feeling that this whole D family thing with the middle initial, you know, Jaguar D, Monkey D, Roger D, um, everyone that we've met up to this point that that seems to be somehow related to Luffy or at least in that family tree of something. I don't know what's going on with it, but I have a feeling that maybe they are possibly the descendants or linked to this nation somehow, some way. And that might be telling of why Luffy seems to just be different, even beyond the devil fruit. And even someone like Saul being up to pick up a ship and also being like at the right place at the right time. And Roger's obviously a legend and all, all these people. I'm wondering if there are abilities that are stemming from this people that they want to squash. I also wonder if the devil fruit has anything to do with that conflict back in the day. Like, is, is the devil fruit the world government's response to this? Did they create it? Did they find it? Are the people that were wiped out, were they the owners of that? I don't know. I'm not sure. This ends off with a bang. I love the moment. I want to live. Let, and Luffy just like, all right, that's all I needed to hear. Let's go. Let's do it. And he does it, and, and all, all hell's breaking loose. Uh, one big callback in this that meant a lot to me as an Usopp fan was the fact that one of the last panels before we see Robin finally give in and admit that she wants to live and have friends and, and, and experience the world uh, is the fact that we see the Usopp panel, have faith in Luffy, which was a very key piece of my Water 7 arc vlog. And I, I hyper fixated on that and I loved it so very much. And for it to get a call back here just shows that Oda knows exactly what he's doing. Like he's placing these little lines, one or two lines or even three words uh, to pay them off in, you know, maybe 10, 20 chapters or maybe hundreds of chapters possibly as I get further in. Uh, but that was very special for me. And I am just like ecstatic. I don't know how this arc could get any better than this like i think the end is going to have to kind of go and we'll go somewhere else for the next arc like it can't get more epic than that right so we're back with the vlog to talk about chapters 400 to 409 which is all of volume 42 uh, I have two volumes left, which will be 43 and 44, but I wanted to come up here because I just finished it. It's a little bit late at night, but I wanted to get this out and, you know, give my in the moment reactions more than like sleeping on it. Uh, this one had a lot of action. This is basically Straw Hats versus CP9. And I will say this action is awesome. I love the creativity from Oda. Uh, a lot of times I watch the anime after I read the action scenes to kind of f figure out how I feel about the fights because action in manga is hit or miss for me uh there there are certain people who do it in a way that i can follow it and i enjoy it and then there are times where i have a really tough time figuring out what's going on it's really nice when you read like the really big manga editions like the uh deluxe berserk editions because the, the picture's bigger so i can actually see it uh with that said without watching the anime episodes i thought these fights were awesome. These are my favorite fights 
in the series so far. And, you know, this is kind of a repetition thing, right? This is a repetitive thing where uh, the evil group has a bunch of people and we have straw hats and they break out into their own individual combat. But I just thought that this split up felt a little bit more natural and less forced and also it was just really entertaining. And Funk freed the elephant turned into a sword. And if that isn't one of the coolest things I've ever read in my life, then I don't, I really don't know what is. I mean, an elephant sword, can I buy one of those? And before I go too far, uh, correction in the last section, I said that Luffy shot down the world government flag. I was speaking fast, messed up. It was Sniper King. He said, hey, Sniper King, shoot that flag down. So the Sniper King had a big moment there, and I felt like I should probably bring that up. And I realized it whenever uh, Sniper King runs in to CP9 member, and they're like, hey, aren't you the one that shot down the flag? And he's like, no, oh, no, <laughs> not good. Also enjoyed uh, him trying to sneak up, and then the rooster... <laughs> chirping he's like what kind of rooster are you really good stuff for sniper king so the straw hats for cp9 fights are really really killer and my biggest standout for this is just how much i really love frankie uh frankie has just a different vibe about him because he is a cyborg and those abilities actually end up being used right like, like he feels different on page when he is fighting which is great uh and just has some really cool abilities good dialogue i like that he's drinking cola constantly uh to level up it's just kind of a goofy thing but uh he seems extremely powerful uh usopp is being used but dude the handcuffing <laughs> of zoro and usopp I'm sorry, Sniper King. I'm uh, sorry, Sniper King, Sniper King. Uh, you know, Sniper King, I'm just gonna call him Usopp, guys. Usopp is, you know, one of my favorite characters, but like he's so dumb sometimes that I'm just, I get frustrated. Like I was like, oh no. Like I wanna see like a Zoro fight where it's just his raw power and abilities without being like handicapped or like, you know, two on one or something like that. But the way that they end up trying to get around this and he suggests cutting off the hand and Usopp's like, it's the craziest idea I have ever heard. <laughs> and Zoro's like, well, fine, I have another idea. And he ends up using Usopp as his sword. And Usopp's like, I'm suing you. One day I will sue you. I just, I, I loved it. And it actually was kind of badass too. I don't know why, what about it, but it's like, okay, Zoro is uh, very resourceful, clearly. Uh, the only thing I didn't care for that much was the powers that Khalifa has, which are the bubble bubble, but which, by the way, uh, Kaku has the devil fruit powers of turning into a giraffe, which is kind of funny. And everyone thinks it's funny, but he's like, no, I like it. Like, seriously, I like it. I, I thought that had a lot of charm to it. But I didn't love the Khalifa Nami stuff. I like the fact that Nami kind of came to Sanji's res rescue and uh, is like sticking up for him. I almost feel like it's like a big sister role. I know Sanji wouldn't love to hear that. Uh, so I enjoyed that part of it. And I enjoy that Nami is like thinking through the fight and she obviously has the ability to fight people and she's very strong. Uh, but I don't know. The scenes just didn't do much for me. I don't think the bubble bubble power is my favorite that I've seen thus far. Uh, surely it can be used in very uh, powerful ways and it's very creative, but I don't know. It didn't do much for me. I was really wanting to get back to the Frankie stuff. And then, uh, you know, if Frankie wasn't my favorite, there was another part that just took me by surprise and I loved. And that was Chopper going like rumble three times. And he becomes like this I mean, gigantic, like demon deer almost. Like, I just loved it because Chopper has uh, a lot of utility in the crew as a healer. Uh, I just felt like he hasn't had enough since Drum Island. And I'm just so scared he's going to be relegated to like a third string character in the crew. But him doing this and like seeing the flashbacks to Kareha being like, you can't, that you're losing control of like the devil fruit powers. It like takes over you. You can't do that again. He's like, I know. And then he does it and you just see the implications of it. He's like smashing people into the ground. Like really cool stuff. Like made CP9 look like a joke on um, the person he was fighting. So uh, I love this for Chopper. He needed this moment. And uh, I hope that this is like more to come, that he becomes a more serious threat in a lot of the battles. Towards the end of this, we get into stupid Spandam, uh, you know, hitting the wrong snail transponder and calling it a buster call. And I'm just like, that's pretty convenient, like like to get this all kind of wrapped up and get it back into the buster call. Uh, I'm fine with that, but Spandam is just so stupid. And all he cares about is promotion. And then he's, you know, actually transmitting his plans and how he doesn't care about anybody else. And all he wants is his promotion. Uh, he's just such a moron and focused around climbing that ladder in the world government. He is such a middle manager. Like it, it, he, he has the middle manager vibe 
all about him. Uh, so that's going to be interesting. I kind of figured it would might like this would result in a buster call some way, somehow, like this would be the end point for this arc possibly. So I'm kind of curious to see what happens with that. I'm not sure where we're going to go with this. Like, like I know there's a time skip in one piece uh, just because like people talk about it all the time. And I wonder if like the bus call is going to go off and everyone's going to get like scattered, like trying to get away from it. And then like maybe in the time skip, what they like crew members find each other again and like they've changed. Like maybe that's what something will happen. I guess that's my theory for this uh, part of the vlog. But the other I forgot my background lights again, whatever. Uh, so the other thing that we're looking forward to and it begins at the end of the uh, the volume 42 is Luffy versus Lucci, which Lucci um I was real excited whenever he was one of the good guys. I thought he was really interesting and the whole pigeon and talking and, uh, you know, he ended up being a piece of crap and kind of a sociopath. He just wants to do violence and kill people. So I think he's going to be a pretty powerful foe. I'm really, really excited for this fight. And it's definitely one I'm going to watch the anime for. I'm going to go back and watch all these ones as well. So maybe I'll like the... Uh, Khalifa and Nami fight a little bit more whenever I watch the manga. But I'm excited for Luffy versus Luchi. And we saw third gear Luffy here and he just became a kid. It's like in Dragon Ball GT when like Goku becomes a kid again. And I was like, no, uh, it's not as uh, detrimental here or as anticlimactic here. It's, it's just interesting. Like I don't understand these gears and how they work. And you would imagine like second gear to third gear, like maybe it's not a progression scheme, but j they're just different. You know what I'm saying? Like, like one's not better than the other. They just have totally different utility. Uh, but this one seemed to run out pretty quick. So I'm, I'm very curious about the fuel. Is that why Luffy's eating all the time? Is that, is that possibly one of the things? Uh, but also, how many gears are there? And how do these gears work? And how does he know how to change them? Who taught him? Is it inherited? Like, I don't know. And I know I've speculated about this in uh, past vlogs, but this mystery is remaining. And Third gear wasn't as cool as second gear. Second gear was definitely cooler because it was the first time we see him actually acknowledge this thing. He became a kid. So when he put his thumb in his mouth, did he bite his thumb or was he sucking his thumb? Because I imagine like sucking it like a baby, like, you know, I'm, I don't know why I had to do it for you on camera, but sucking the thumb, making you a child again, possibly. Is that the connection or did he bite his thumb? I couldn't really tell uh, from the manga, but very curious about the things that Luffy is hiding from us, about his abilities solely. Obviously, his backstory is also mysterious, but uh, more so his abilities, which I, obviously is going to be tied into that backstory. So Luffy, Luchi, Buster Call coming. I'm excited. Uh, I'm not going to get to read anymore tonight. I'm dead tired. I'm so, so tired. Uh, but I'll be back soon with reading volume 43. I will probably come back, you know, sometime during that or after that, and then I'll be on to 44. But who knows? Maybe I'll wait to read the rest of it. I guess you'll know in like two seconds. <laughs> Us Usopp fans are eating good tonight. I'm talking about volume 43, which is chapters 410 to 419 that ends with our boy Sniper King sitting on top of the tower. Nico Robin one step away from Spandam becoming a hero. And I'm thinking maybe Saul will show like I, I'm not even sure. Like is Saul even still alive? I'm thinking, how could that happen? Maybe Luffy's going to jump like maybe Sanji's. I don't know. And I didn't account for the Sniper King and Usopp. With everything going on, I kind of lost track of him when Sanji sent him, sent him away. Um, wow. I mean, I am a Nico Robin and Usopp fan, and I am eating good tonight, boy. I am. I'm fired up. It's the man with the power. Too sweet to be sour. It's Usopp from downtown. Long nose, long shot. Big shot Usopp. Just, ah, uh, that felt good. That felt really good as an Usopp fan and everything that he's been through in this arc. I am just, I'm thrilled. I'm so happy. And even though it was only nine chapters and there's a lot of fighting in this, there is so much to dig into and they're just a few main points. And one of them, uh, besides Usopp just being awesome, clearly, is the fact that Nico Robin... <laughs> Nico Robin's character arc is so fascinating to me. And if you had told me that Oda was going to be able to relay the power and the emotion of her character arc by simply um, one panel of her biting into a curb or a, a concrete ledge, I would have never guessed that. Uh, one Piece surprises me in many ways, but this is it. And, and these panels of a character who wanted to die just chapters ago 
to then biting on to concrete till her gums and teeth are bleeding because she wants to live so bad and never loses hope that they said they would save me and they will. I mean, that is all of that character arc in that moment. And it's just so freaking good. Like, it's so good. That is, that's Oda being tremendous at his job. Robin and Usopp are not the only ones that had amazing moments here. We finally get to see, I think, Zoro actually get some time to show off his skills 1v1, even though uh, Kaku is very uh, strange. Sanji has so many one-liners. And when Sanji's being great, he is, I mean, he is that. He is fantastic. And whenever Usopp is about to be killed by the wolf, and I'm thinking in my head, like, no, don't do it. Don't do it. Sanji just coming in and hitting him with the kick and being like, I'm the hunter. And it's like, <sighs> let's go. <laughs> let's go. Pump it directly into my veins. Also, the boy who cried wolf line. I love that. Oh, my God. I love that so much. And he does this spinning thing. And this is like one of the things I, I didn't want to forget to talk about with all the hype that I had coming in here is like th there's a spinning thing and his foot's heating up and we hear the wolf say, oh, it's it's almost like it's demonic powers. And then whenever Zoro is fighting, we see Kaku is like, oh, he's like a six headed demon. And the word demon and demonic is being thrown around. Of course, I think of devil fruit. But like as far as I know, Sanji and Zoro haven't ate devil fruit. So what is this? There has to be something to this. Is this alluding more to the past that these two have had? And also, is Zoro, Zoro, is, he's like, he was almost like he was able to read my moves, which if it was a normal enemy, I would be like, yeah, probably, because like you're telegraphing. But I don't think CP9 and the shave technique would allow that. So I'm beginning to wonder, especially back uh, in Baroque Works, I think it was, whenever Zoro was able to like predict movements. Does he have something similar to the mantra that we saw from uh, Enel or Enner from Skypea? Is is that what's being hinted at here? And does that have anything to do with this demonic power and stuff that we're talking about? Like, these are really, really small moments just kind of sprinkled into a lot of action and a lot of movement and all of the Nico Robbins stuff. But I didn't want to lose that uh, in this vlog because I wrote it in big capital letters in my notes as I was reading because I was like, as soon as I get upstairs, I got I to gotta get all this out. I'm keeping an eye on it uh, and I'm probably just really wrong. Also in the last vlog update, when uh, Nami and Khalifa began their fight, I said I wasn't really feeling it. I thought it was eh, kind of okay. I actually really, really liked their stuff uh, in 410 to 419. And I think that Nami having the Mirage ability was really cool. And their fight ended up being really entertaining. So I'm glad that I was able to be proven wrong and that Oda did make that actually really compelling for me. You gotta love the campy, very cheesy line. It's not a prediction, it's a forecast. Uh, weather girl Nami is something I'm here for. And I guess this isn't going to be as long. I mean, there's a lot of energy I'm putting out here at um, 10 o'clock at night. <laughs> but I, I just needed to come up here and, and talk about this and, and ugh, vomit this out and just be so hyped, dude. Like, I, I genuinely am excited. And it just feels so good to be this into a story. I mean, this was such a good volume and I don't know what's about to happen now because it feels like we have a little bit of the leg up but the buster call is coming uh two small things that I'll close this out with before I go back and read uh issue 44 and finish out finish out this arc of Eni's lobby which is crazy is I laughed hysterically whenever Usopp was being used as Zoro's sword and he called him the no storm killer blade Loved it. That was hilarious. But a more important thing is, is that I've been paying attention to the chapter covers, and it seems that this Baroque's reunion has thrown the Baroque's work agents in jail from Doflamingo to other people. But the big one is, is that they're all going to Impel Down, which we know is kind of near where we are in the story. Crocodile was in that lineup. And I'm thinking, are we going to see Crocodile again? Because Impel Down, if it's close enough, I assume we'll go there. I assume... Something has to take place there. So are we going to get a Baroque like reunion with the crew? Are they going to be like possibly prisoners in the same thing? Like are the Straw Hats going to get captured here? What's going to happen? I feel like I need to kind of, I'm hyped up. The Usopp moment, honestly, was everything. Like it was the best thing in One Piece ever. I loved it. I loved it so much. But I do... I have this like terrible feeling that the rug is going to get pulled out from under me in my next update. And I'm going to sit down on this camera and be like super sad. I hope that's not the case. I really hope. But if so, if they end up with Crocodile, that could be a really cool storyline. So I would be down for that. I just don't want to lose any more of the crew. I don't want to lose anyone from the crew. I'll see you again 
for the final part of this vlog. And uh, it's been a wild ride so far. Okay, I said it could not get any higher uh, of a moment than Robin yelling, I want to live. And that was completely incorrect. And all of you watching knew that as you went through this video and I did not. I literally just finished, <clears throat> I just finished volume 44, uh, which is going to be covering chapters 420 through 430. And uh, the going Mary is gone. And congratulations, Oda, you made me extremely emotional on my couch reading about a fake, like, what am I doing? I got teary eyed over a fictional ship with a sheep's head on it. How is this not the greatest story ever told? <laughs> How does that happen? Oh my God. Uh, these final 10 chapters, uh, I, I don't have the words to describe the exhilaration and the thrill and the agony that was the end of Annie's lobby. Um, when they are hearing a voice, I'm like, who in the world could it be? Like, I, you know, they need to jump. They're about to get killed. The buster calls ha hitting. And I'm like, what, is, what is literally, I, I was like, I have no idea who's saving them. Uh, it's not uh Kakaru or Kakaro. I, the mermaid lady. I was like, oh, maybe it's her, but no, she's with them. Like who, who it, and you look down and it's the going Mary. I was like, <laughs> like, are you kidding me? <laughs> like, I stood up out of my chair. I stood up off of the couch. Like if I thought that Sniper Usopp uh, hitting, uh, you know, Spandime or whatever and getting Robin free last time was big, this is even bigger. The most oh shit moment in, in One Piece so far. And this is like one of my favorite stories ever. Like are you are you kidding me? In, in the crescendo of all of this, of everything that's happening and Usopp taking off his mask and being like, Luffy, it's me. Like, get up. You're not in the afterlife yet. And Luffy's like, you know what? You're right. And then Luffy beating Lucci at the end. I Everything is just like building and building and building. My God. So they jump on the going Mary and, and all this stuff has happened. And we get to this point where like the crew is doing what they're supposed to do. Like Nami's being a navigator. Zoro and Sanji are fighting. But when the cannonball shoots and then Luffy tanks it. And it's because Zoro and Sanji are holding down his limbs that he doesn't go flying. It's like, this is the unity that we wanted to get back. And just thinking about where this arc started out with, you know, not even arc, but this whole saga. Uh, thinking about where it was and the going Mary looking down and Usopp leaving the crew and Robin being gone and fighting, fighting to get her back. And then going to world with the world government. And it's like, I, to wrap it up like this and then the going Mary... Um, the goodbye is just like the most it's so emotional and I feel so weird for saying that, but it's true. I got choked up at a lump in my throat and um, I, saying goodbye to the going Mary was tough. It was tough. I'll, I'll just say that iceberg fixing up the going Mary for one last go and going Mary coming to the rescue. I mean, Goodbye and God bless going Mary. I, the best ship that there ever has been ever. There is no sea Going Mary couldn't cross and being there and going just one further time. And then the going Mary saying, I wanted to take you further. Oh my goodness. And then the burning of the ship is so appropriate. I don't know how I can even talk about it in any other way other than it's just like tough, but it's so touching. It's so good. Oda is, is incredible. I mean, literally just a fantastic storyteller uh, among the best. And uh, this is hard to get over. There is other, some other stuff in here that I did want to talk about. Uh, you know, obviously I already talked about Usopp pulling off his mask. That was a huge moment. Robin finally getting to slap uh, Spandam, or Spandam around. Really needed that uh, for sure. But there's also the fact that Frankie is a real one. Frankie was willing to throw down his life for the Straw Hat crew. So I know he's going to be joining us now uh, here on the Straw Hats because I, I actually had someone spoil that for me. But I don't care. It was so good. I'm so glad that he's going to be joining the crew. They need him. And what about what about Luffy? Luffy and Lucci was a phenomenal fight. Best fight since Luffy and Crocodile. I think I liked it maybe just as much or a little bit more. And learning more about the gear abilities and what it takes out of Luffy. And realizing that Luffy, to save his friends, was shortening his life. And the gear three that he ends up using to hit the giant, like the giant... Uh, 
whatever punch that he had. Oh my goodness, I thought that was incredible. Uh, what a cool panel too, that massive fist coming out of the side of that building or the tower or whatever. It's like, holy crap. And I was so confused because Gear 3, he made himself like really small earlier. And I was like, okay, that's weird. Gear 3 seems like way less cool than Gear 2. But I'm realizing that his body is like shrinking and growing based on him like blowing into his stomach, like blowing up a balloon, right? I'm like, okay, now that makes a lot of sense. I'm so sorry if this is, uh, <laughs> I'm just exasperated. Like I am, I am exhausted from reading those, t <laughs> those 10 chapters. Really, I am. Uh, there, there, there's some weirdness, uh, around Luffy that I also want to comment before I take this vlog home and go cry in a corner thing about the going Mary is, uh, Lucci and Luffy are fighting. Okay. And Lucci says, there's an idiot I would love to tell about you, meaning that he would like to go tell someone about Luffy. And he calls him an idiot and says, Luffy uh, deserves the title of captain. Like he truly is a captain. And I'm wondering if Lucci then maybe knew Roger or maybe he's talking about Shanks possibly. Like there's obviously someone that Luffy would uh, interest Someone out there that would be interested in Luffy, and I'm wondering if it might have reminded him of someone he met in his past. So where did Luchi come from? Is Luchi actually gone gone? Uh, it looked like it, but it's One Piece, so I'm not totally sure. But Luchi also, his backstory about being a boy and being sent in and taking basically taking out all these soldiers, like 500 soldiers, and then cutting off the pirate's head, and at 13 going into CP9, he has all these scars on him. It makes me wonder Luchi's backstory. And it also makes me wonder like why he is the way he is and why he wants to kill so much. Like he, he is thriving on violence. He thirsts for it. But in one piece, it rarely feels like characters who are given a, the, you know, given that kind of um, attitude. Like for instance, like, you know, Nico Robin was a monster and maybe did have some bad characteristics, but we found out there was a reason. So I'm wondering if Lucci also maybe possibly has reasons behind that. Another really interesting thing going back to Luffy is that Chopper mentions that it feels like Luffy knew all along that he would have to fight Luchi like by the end. And then Nami says, yes, it's like he has, you know, animal instincts. And again, his name is Monkey D. Luffy. And then we met Jaguar D. Saul. And I'm like, OK, is there something like with the animals? I, I don't know. I know this is hinting at something. What it's hinting at, I don't know. And I need to find out. I'm so glad that the Frankie family is okay. And also Kokoro being a mermaid, didn't see that coming. She mentions the Fishmen. Uh, I know we're probably going to end up going to Fishman Island at some point. So I'm excited to see more about them and uh, maybe some more mermaids. They seem very, <laughs> very interesting. Uh, but wow, what a way to come together. What a way to build out a whole different cast of characters by the end of this. And I mean, just like the build up and the finish to this arc was the best. It was the best in manga I've read. And I think One Piece may finally be etching into that first place territory for me when it comes to manga. Uh, I see why this is so beloved. And just the build up to the Going Mary being gone. Like it could have just easily been a tearful goodbye earlier and then she was wrecked in the, in the waters or whatever. But then getting Iceberg back involved. Just like every thread coming back and making this just beautiful send off. And ending the arc there, by the way, Oda, very brutal, because now, like, I can't stop. I'm going to have to go and get post endies immediately uh, and try to get that vlog out just like this one. But all I can say about Any's Lobby is it was hype, and the hype was real. I loved it just as much as I thought. I liked it way more than I thought I would, and people hyped this up to be, like, peak fiction, peak One Piece. And it certainly is peak One Piece for me at this point. And I'm just like, where do we go from here? Thank you so much for sticking with me through this very long vlog and getting through Any's Lobby. This is probably the most anticipated video I've had here on Dudes Talking Manga that we have done. And uh, it has been an absolute blast, even though it has also been quite exhausting. I appreciate everyone's patience for me. Uh, taking some time to get this video out. I was going through some health stuff and uh, needed... Needed to get that taken care of because, uh, you know, I, I got to make it through. I don't want to be going like the going Mary. Um, RIP, no disrespect. Uh, but 
yeah, so thank you for your patience. And if you like this video, it helps us out a ton if you would hit like. And if you loved it and you've never subscribed before, we'd love to have you subscribe here. I'm going to be going into post any. He's going to be doing every arc just like this. And as well as Andrew, the other host on this channel, is just finishing up East Blue Saga finally. And then he'll be getting into Alabasta. So we're going to be revisiting old arcs. I'll get to go talk to him about that. And it'll be a lot of fun. Uh, we would love to have you along for our journey. But <laughs> it's over. Any's Lobby is complete. And I'm so glad that you were here to experience it with me. As I guess wrong, yell at the camera, and really uh, maybe make a fool of myself a bit. But you know what? It's all good because One Piece is awesome. <laughs> but until we see you next time, we hope you're good. We hope you're safe. And we'll see you again real, real soon here on Dudes Talking Manga.